This was supposed to be world's most advanced airliner ever built. Instead, it turned into a cost overrunning money hole. Great aircraft and great competition. It's success in some terms and not in others. A jet designed to land itself in the 60s and to compete against giants like McDonald Douglas. This is a special one, but was it really that good? Was it TriStar's fault that Lockheed would never build another airliner? And lastly, could it really auto land? Well, let's have a look. It's the 60s and aviation was booming and airlines were always on the hunt for a new aircraft, including American Airlines. They were seeking a new airliner capable of carrying 250 passengers on transcontinental routes. Two very different aircraft manufacturers stood up to the claim. Longtime famous and trusted McDonnell Douglas and the mostly military and very ambitious Lockheed. Having experienced difficulties with some of its military programs, Lockheed was eager to re-enter the civilian market with a smaller white body jet and its response was the L-1011 TriStar. Douglas aircraft answered with the DC-10, which had a similar three-engine configuration and dimensions. Despite their similarities, however, the L-1011 and DC-10 engineering approach differed greatly. McDonnell Douglas, who had recently taken over Douglas aircraft, directed DC-10 development on a very firm budget. Cost runs absolutely unacceptable even at the expense of safety. And that approach meant that reusing Douglas DC-8 technology. By contrast, Lockheed would take the most advanced technology of the day and use it. And if it wasn't existing, they would create it. So, two very different approaches. For the L-1011, in order to give it lower noise emissions, improve reliability and high efficiency over the first generation jetliners. And so, the stage was set and development started. And this was a rush development. Initiated in 1965, Lockheed started on a challenging journey of constructing the L-1011 TriStar. However, they encountered hurdles such as soaring costs and persistent delays. Meanwhile, over at Douglas, they were running ahead with all the engineers sat on task, and that showed both positively and negatively, we'll come to later. The TriStar's layout was for 400 passengers with a configuration of two aisles and three engines, deliberated the option of having two engines but ultimately opted for three to enhance takeoff power. The 1980s posed limitations on twin engine planes for long transoceanic flights, preferring the TriStar's three engine design. In contrast to its counterpart, the McDonnell Douglas DC-10, the TriStar displayed distinct features near its rear. The DC-10 positioned its engine above the aircraft, while the TriStar ingeniously housed the engine at the rear, utilizing an S-shaped tube to minimize drag and enhance stability. Lockheed's ingenious design not only optimized the engine's functionality, but also contributed to the aircraft's reduced weight when unoccupied. A pivotal display lay in the engine selection with Lockheed opting for the Rolls-Royce RB211. This free-spool engine equipped with a special fan promising superior performance compared to DC-10's engine. The triple-spool design aimed to deliver equivalent or greater power within a smaller size, reducing drag. However, challenges persisted and the DC-10 secured a head start, with the first TriStar rolling off the production line in 1971, while the DC-10 was already in production. The situation exacerbated as Rolls-Royce faced setbacks with the engine, causing further delays and compounding Lockheed's predicament. The prototype conducted its inaugural flight on November 16, 1970, and following certification on April 14, 1972, deliveries commenced. In 1971, the first delivery was delivered and deliveries began, with 160 orders. Yikes! Not good. Meanwhile, the DC-10 was working with 300. Production started at Lockheed's facilities in Burbank and Palmdale, California. The first airliner was delivered to Eastern Airlines on April 26, 1972. Back in 1972, the unit cost was around $20 million, equivalent to approximately $107 million in 2024. 
Early in its service, Lockheed identified higher than estimated structural weight, engine weight, and fuel consumption issues with the TriStar. To address this, a structural kit was developed, allowing for an increase of maximum takeoff weight on later production aircraft. However, the weight concerns affected the desirability of early production L-1011-1 aircraft. Though not a huge success, Lockheed went on to make a full other six variants. They include the Dash 100, featuring a higher gross weight and increased range by 1,500 kilometers. Dash 150 was a conversion kit from the first Dash 1, featuring a higher gross weight and better range. Dash 200, the same as Dash 100, but all new, more modern RRRB 201. Dash 524B engines to improve its performance with better range and slightly lighter. Dash 500, the L1011 Dash 500, the final variant, entered production in 1978, featuring a shortened fuselage, increased MTOV, and advanced technologies. The first flight was 1978, with British Airways receiving the first delivery in 1979. Despite popularity, it entered service seven years after the similar DC 10 Dash 30. Equipped with RB211 524B engines, it had improved performance and fuel efficiency. The TriStar 500 had a maximum capacity of 315 and a range of 5,200 nautical miles. Only 250 TriStars were ever sold compared to 400 DC 10s, leading to Lockheed ending production in 1984 after delivering to 250th and the last L1011 on order. The TriStar struggled to break even and achieve profitability led Lockheed to exit the civilian aircraft business. The competition with the DC-10 underscored the challenges of splitting the market that couldn't support both aircraft. Despite proposals for new designs based on the TriStar's features, financial constraints prevented further development. McDonnell Douglas facing its own challenges could only refine the DC-10 into the MD-11 instead of introducing a new design to compete with the next generation of twin jets like the Boeing 777 and 787. All of this technology came at a price and 35 TriStars were involved in an accident with a total of over 300 fatalities. Though this does sound like a lot, the DC-10 was a lot worse. And this was the safest aircraft for its time. Notable incidents include Delta Airlines Flight 191 One of the most tragic accidents involving a TriStar occurred on August 2nd, 1985 when a Delta Airlines Flight 191 crashed near Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. The aircraft encountered severe weather conditions including a microburst during its approach. The plane lost altitude on short final and crashed, resulting in the deaths of 137 people. Eastern Airlines Flight 401 on December 29, 1972, an Eastern Airlines Flight 401, a TriStar, crashed in the Florida Everglades while preparing for landing. The accident occurred due to flight crew's unintentional disengagement of the autopilot while focusing on a faulty landing gear light. After 176 people on board, 101 lost their lives. Saudi Air Flight 163 a Lockheed L-1011 TriStar faced a devastating incident on August 19, 1980 at Riyadh's King Khalid International Airport. After takeoff, a fire erupted in the aft baggage compartment. Despite a safe emergency landing, delays in initiating the evacuation resulted in the tragic loss of all 287 lives on board. Now, despite this, the TriStar was much more safe than DC-10. Actually, it was the safest jet for its time. We'll quickly go over the dimensions of the TriStar. These are for the TriStar 500, Lockheed's final L1011 variant. It had an overall length of 164 feet 2 inches and a wingspan increased to 164 feet 4 inches. Earlier TriStar versions had the TriStar 1 wingspan of 155 feet. So, it's a pretty big aircraft. In terms of range, it could fly 7,410 kilometers. A similar 200 to 300 seater jet today, like the Boeing 787 9, has a range of 14,140 kilometers, over double the amount. But for its time, it has a pretty impressive range. 
But sadly, today all but one are retired. They can be found all over the world in different museums, but most are either scrapped or in an aircraft graveyard. The one that's still in service is the Stargazer Air, which is owned by Northrop Grumman and it uses to launch satellites into space. The Lucky Tristar, huge and advanced, made by the underdogs for the big guys. Though falling short in orders, it didn't in technology, paving the way for much more technology in future aircraft. With a mere 250 built, it was a modest success, but like all others, ultimately got replaced by much newer aircraft. That was all I had for you today. If you liked it, remember to subscribe, like, do whatever you want, and see you in the next one. See ya!